always weird when you say man in a prayer. I don't know how God feels about that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay. Here's, <laughs> here's how we're going to start. Um, before we move right into that first question, which is who wrote the Psalms, I want to give you a little bit of fun facts, some, some information, some background. And if you were here in the fall, some of this I said, but some of it I've added new and exciting information. So listen. Okay. First thing I want to tell you about the book of Psalms is it's in the Old Testament. It's in the left side of your Bible. Old Testament's on the left, New Testament's on the right. New Testament is when Jesus comes on the scene. He puts on skin and comes down into earth, and it's his ministry and the church that comes after. The Old Testament is, and I heard it described this way, I thought it was super cool, it's the anticipation of the coming Savior. And so even in Psalms, even before Jesus is on the scene, we are going to see these um, the, 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 these looking forward, the shadows, the illusions, the, 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 all these beautiful things that show us that he's coming. And so I'm excited for you to see how that works. So Old Testament, left side, um, it's the largest book in the Bible. How many chapters? Anybody remember? One, five, oh, that's a lot, and that's a lot, isn't it? Okay, you're not hitting all of them in 11 weeks, so don't just walk out right now. We're going to cover a good number of them, but not all of them. It's the most frequently quoted Old Testament book in the New Testament. It's quoted in the New Testament. Are you ready for this? Over 400 times. It's either quoted or alluded to. And so, oh, how cool is that, right? Like that, that tells me that this has meaning and it has power. It's not in order. There's not a chronological order. It's actually the 150 Psalms, which the word Psalm means song. And so there's songs and prayers and, and poems and stories, but the thing is they're not in an order. But what did come is um, years after they were written, some arrangers came in and kind of grouped them. And what they did is they grouped them into five little collections. And, and so when you hear me say we're starting book three of the Psalms, I'm not talking about Psalm 3. I'm talking about the section that begins, it's about halfway through. And so, in fact, your homework this next week you're going to read the last psalm in book three of the entire Psalter, okay? That's another thing, that word Psalter, just throw that around today at like Corner Bakery when you're having lunch. It sounds very Bible smart. It's very impressive. All that means, it's the, it's the entirety of the 150 psalms, okay? So when you hear somebody say Psalter, you can be like, I know that, totally. So we're going to cover in this study, we're going to start with book three, and that starts around 89, Psalm 89, and we're going to move all the way through to the end, okay? Okay. Um, Oh, Jesus quotes the Psalms 11 times. And that's just what we know. Remember, we, we've had eyewitnesses that recorded what Jesus said and did. And so 11 times, 11 different times, he quotes the Psalms. Psalm 119 is the largest chapter in the entire Bible. Psalm 117 is the shortest chapter in the entire Bible. And here's another thing that I think is very important for all of us to know. Um, the first thing I want to tell you, especially if you're new to your Bible, is there's this thing in the Bible. It's very powerful and amazing tool. And um, I use it all the time. And it's called the table of contents. <laughs> Anybody ever heard of one of these? Yeah, right? And there's another thing that's really cool, like tabs, and they can help you flip around. And there's also this other super cool thing, and it's called a, a, it's called a smartphone. And that's great because you can flip around. But I'm going to tell you, use this. Use this um, because I, I, there's going to be times where I'm going to tell you to go to different places that are not in the Psalms, and you're going to not know where to go, and that's okay because nobody in the whole wide world knows where Hosea is in the Bible. No one, zero people. If they say they do, they're lying to you. They don't know. It's table contents. Okay. The other thing that's really cool and important and is going to make you very Bible smart, you ready? Everybody knows. If you were here in the last semester, you know what I'm about to tell you. This is what's cool. When you go up to people and you say, yeah, I'm studying the Psalms, let me open to the Psalms. You just do that. It's right there, right in the middle of your Bible. Try it. Go home and try it. Just pop it open to the middle, and it will open to Psalms. You're welcome. I feel like I gave some valuable information there. <laughs> um, those are important things. Um, Martin Luther. Martin Luther. He was a 16th century theologian. So you know what that means? Guy that lived a long time ago and knows a lot of stuff about the Bible. And, and the Lord, awesome, awesome words. He said this about the Psalms, and I, I quoted it in the first semester, and I had to say it again because I feel like it's powerful. He said this about the Psalms. He said, the Psalter might well be called a little Bible. In it is comprehended most beautifully and briefly every single thing that's in the entire Bible so that anyone who could not read the whole Bible 
would have anyway almost an entire summary of it comprised in one book. That's what you're taking on. It's so powerful that it encompasses everything that we find in the Bible, the hope and the glory and the anticipation and the prophecy and the looking back and the struggles and the strife and the depression and the anxiety and the joy and the peace and all the things that we encounter on this journey, right? And all the things that are encompassed in here, you're going to get to cover in the book of Psalms. That's awesome. Well, I will tell you this too. I found this interesting. Um, nearly every life question, you know the big life questions? I don't know where you are with Jesus and what you think about who he was and, and what your relationship with the Lord is, but I'm going to tell you this. Every single one of us, no matter who we worship, because we all do worship someone or something, don't ever, don't ever be confused that you don't. Every one of us asks major life questions, and they're all addressed in the Psalms. That's a big statement, isn't it? You're going to see questions like um, how to remain godly in the face of great trial. Anyone? You're going to see questions about injustices. You're going to see questions about dealing with depression and despair and hopelessness. You're going to see questions about facing our own mortality at the end of our lives. You're going to see questions that are about why a good God would ever allow suffering. You're going to see questions about repentance and forgiveness and mercy and reconciliation to an entire world. And then you're going to see awesome questions about the glory and grandeur of our Savior. And, and, and that is going to be such an incredible journey because that's the questions that we ask. Even if it's just in our head or in our journal, these are questions we all wrestle with. And some of the questions you're going to find answers to, and some of them we're just going to wrestle along with the psalmist to them. Well, if you look at your page, I gave you some questions um, that kind of give us some background about the psalms. And I want to go over those with you briefly before we head to our time um, in small group and you get to meet each other and, and, and become best friends. So the first question is this, who wrote the book of psalms? Who knows? Anyone have an answer? If somebody says Jesus, I'm going to give you a high five because that's hilarious. <laughs> and the, last night when I taught this class, one of the mo young mommies, she has like preschoolers. She goes, God wrote it. I'm like, you have preschoolers. I love that you said that. <laughs> it's true though, really. I mean, God is the author ultimately. But um, the cool thing about Psalms, I forever and ever thought it was King David. Anybody else? Like, I, I mean, that's kind of what you always hear. Um, he wrote most of them. King David was the second king of Israel. And his story is found in like First and Second Samuel. So if you want to go back and do a little light reading later, just go for it. Have at it. Um, he was a God-anointed king. But anyway, he wrote about 75-ish. We, we say ish because a couple of them were making assumptions we don't know. But he wrote most of them. There were actually seven composers, composers, at least seven. So David wrote a whole bunch of them. The sons of Korah wrote 10 of them. Asaph wrote 12 of them. Solomon, and that's actually King David's son, so that would make him the third king of Israel, and he was known as being the wisest man that ever lived. He wrote two, and we're going to hit those. Um, Moses wrote one. We're going to talk about that one. Herman wrote one. Ethan wrote one. And there's 48-ish others that we don't really know that are anonymous. And I just get, I get real geeky about that because I think that's so cool. You know why? I think God conceals the identity because he wants us to remember that ultimately he's the author. Amen. I mean, sometimes there's just stuff we're not going to know, and you know why? This is just a wonderful adage. You can, write, you can write this down. It's very important truth. He is God, and we are not. And he is not going to reveal every single thing, and that's the beauty of the mystery of God because we can't handle it. And so I love when he leaves the, the mystery and the anonymity because I kind of wonder, is he doing that so I can take it on as my own? I don't know. But um, it's kind of cool that there's that many authors to this beautiful um, story that we're going to see unfold in Psalms. When was it written? Well, because so many dudes wrote it, it spans over 900 to 1,000 years, these, these words do. So that's pretty cool, right? It goes from the time of Moses all the way to like the late 6th, early 5th century B.C. Tons of years, tons of experiences that we're going to see and we're going we're gonna to cover. To whom was it written? Well, that's an easy answer. To the people of God. It was written to the people of God. And guess what? I have super great news for everyone in here. That's us. Isn't that cool? Well, it was written to the people of God, but in the, in the time that it was written, it was primarily intended for community worship. 
And the reason I say community worship is because what we're going to find and we're going to hit some of these psalms that were actually written for communities to be making the trek to Jerusalem. At the end, there's like four, six or something of them. They're called the Psalms of Ascent, and we're going to cover those later in our, our lessons. And it's so powerful to remember that one author wrote these so that community could worship with them. You know, I think about, like, to me, that's kind of weird because I, I, sometimes I open this and I feel like I'm reading someone's journal, right? Sometimes you open it and you're like, ooh, this is personal. This is, this is gritty. Um, but I think about the great old hymns. Anyone? If you go to this church or other churches, every now and then they slide one in and it's, oh, it's so cool, right? You hear praise and worship and then you hear, you know, great is thy faithfulness or whatever, and you're like, oh, yeah. But here's what's neat about the old hymns. Is, is when you look at the history of them, often they were written by one or two people about their personal experiences with their faith or their struggles or, or their lives, right? They were written by a guy, but they were intended for worship in community. They weren't just written for the guy, right? And so that's what psalms are really to me is that they're these beautiful hymns intended to express something very personal. And you're going to see some of them are really personal, but they're intended for every one of us to grab onto them and worship God with them and, uh, and come to know him through them. Um, Jesus sang them. The apostles sang them. The New Testament church sang them. They were powerful. They were written for us. The next question is in what style was this book written? In what style was it written? It was written, it's considered a poetry book. And I'll be honest with you, like um, years ago, younger Chris um, was like, dude, I'm not reading that. I'm not into poetry. No, thank you. I took English literature and it was very stressful, so no. And so if you heard that and you're just like, I'm out and I'm out, <laughs> I want to encourage you in this way. It's not, um, it's not poetry in the way you're thinking of. Here's, here's what, I, I found this description. I thought this was beautifully said and I believe that this is true with Psalms. Poetry is a special use of language. Poetry is not designed basically to communicate information. You know, there's a lot of books in the Bible that are historic, right? There's a lot of books that are chronological and tell a story. This one is not just giving us information, but rather poetry is the language of experience. Poetry is the language of experience. It's really powerful in the way it can communicate. And I think you're going to find that. You know, I've heard before people ask, you know, why are you studying this old book? You know, why do you, I mean, you know, you could just, you could read, why, why study? Why spend time praying about it? Why dig in so deep? And you know what? I heard a great explanation once is that the Bible is not just um, a book of words, a history book. It's not even just a true book. It's about an experience. And that experience is a relationship with, with the creator. That's bigger than just reading words, guys. And Psalms is going to show you that. Like you are going to feel the experience because, because you're going to be invited into it, frankly. And so I hope that you will take that step and experience him in that way. In the poetry that we're going to see in Psalms, you're going to see all kinds of elements that um, are really helpful to help the people at the time in a practical way remember the words. Okay? That's the truth of it. There's repetition, there's parallelism, there's acrostics and alphabetical arrangements, and there's tons of metaphors. Anybody? Like, who doesn't love a good metaphor? Because you learn from that, right? And so when you hear all this, don't think of it in our day, in the way we walk around with our smartphones and our keyboards and our voice you know, recordings and stuff. Remember it this way, that these were written and they were then again recited not because they had them written down, but because they had them written in their hearts. And so some of these cool poetic ways were so that they could remember them, like songs, like the greatest songs ever, you know, that you remember forever. That's, that's what was beautiful about poetry here. Um, commonly people, well, there's, there's a couple of different um, thoughts on this, but the Psalms, the 150 of them, are really broken into like five categories, and, and you'll see it. They, the, some of them are kind of obvious um, one is, is there are wisdom psalms, and those are, we're going to get instructions for right living. And you're going to see this. The ones that Solomon wrote are pretty cool that way because it's kind of like, okay, here's your prescription. And I like that. It's pretty straightforward. But then you're going to see the laments, the laments, and those are the ones that deal with the struggles. Anybody in the first semester, y'all, like, we did that. We don't, we're done with that. Well, we're pretty done. We're not totally done. Don't, don't hold your breath. Um, but... 
we are moving into praises, and that's the third kind is the praise. And so I think you're going to love that, that the, you guys that have come for the first time this semester, you came at the right time, amen? We cried a lot of tears last semester, and we want to do some praising. And so you're going to see more praises in the third and the fourth and the fifth books of Psalms. Um, there are royal psalms, and those are universally theocratic um, in nature. Like they see, they talk about the coming of, of the great king, and they talk about the coming of the king, Jesus. They allude to that, and, and, and they prophesy about that even when they maybe don't realize that that's what they're talking about. So that's kind of cool. Those are neat. And then Thanksgiving psalms, and that's just what you would think. They're all about gratitude. The thing I love about Psalms is oftentimes you see um, a turning point or a pivot, don't you? You see the beginning of it, and it's my words, my journal. Why are you letting this happen? How long is this going to happen? And then you see this moment where the psalmist takes a turn, and I'm excited for you to see that, where he says, but you are still God. And I think that's kind of the bottom line. And so when we move into the idea of the central themes, I hope you'll remember that central themes of Psalms. If you go and, and consult the great theologian Google and ask what the central themes of Psalms are, there's a lot of them. It's 150 chapters, right? So there's like a ton. But I will tell you this, um, there are two that I feel like we can really drill down and focus on when we study Psalms, and they are this. The first is this, and, and I hope you will take this into your life and remember this. God is not an indifferent observer. He is not an indifferent observer. No matter how you feel, no matter how it looks, no matter what the world is telling you, he's not. He's not indifferent. And you're going to see it in the Psalms because you're going to see the psalmist share their experiences with him. And the second um, central theme that I would say we're going to hit over this next 11 weeks is that you can trust him with your whole heart in every single moment of your life. You can trust him with your whole heart in every moment of your life. That's a lot of hyperbole in that statement, amen? That's a lot of big words that you can trust him with every single moment with my whole heart. I don't know where you are with the word trust, but I've been mulling it over for the past few weeks thinking this is what we got to talk about today. And so before we close, I just want to share a couple of thoughts on that idea of trust and trusting in a God um, who we can give our whole heart to in every single moment. Trust. If you define the word trust, if you go look it up, and Webster says it this way, that it's placing a firm belief in the reliability, the truth, the ability, or the strength of someone or something. That's what truth is. I mean, that's what trust is. I, okay, Bear with me. This is Chris's opinion, not the Bible's opinion. I'm going to say this out loud because I believe on a microphone. So I think it's true. Okay, ready? I don't think it's hard for us to trust. I do not think we struggle with trust. I think we like to say we do. I don't think we struggle with it. I think in general, we trust and, and we are very trusting. Here's what I do believe, though. I believe that we struggle trusting God with our lives, and that's hard. Amen? An unseen, unknown God, sometimes, most times, all times, it's really hard, right, to trust him with the, with the circumstances and the tangible things that you're watching unfold in your life and say, I trust you, Lord, kumbaya, right, amen? That's hard. But we don't have a hard time trusting, and so I'm going to prove it to you. You ready? I'm going to say some words, and I want you to think about the idea of trust, the idea of placing a firm belief in the reliability, truth, and ability or strength of someone or something, and I want you to ask yourself, am I a, am I a can I trust? Because you do. You ready? Here we go. Airplanes and light switches. Okay? You step on an airplane, and what do you expect is going to happen? You're going to go up in the air, and you're going to be okay, and you're going to get a drink on the plane, and you're going to chill, and you're going to hang out and recline your seat and maybe watch a movie, and then you're going to land, and you're going to be where you're supposed to be. Anybody else? Okay. If you are an aviation specialist, then maybe you know how that happens, but I'm going to guess, no offense, you all look super smart, but most of us don't. We just step on the plane and we do what? Trust. What about light switches? I trust that this is going to come on when I flick the switch. Okay, you ready? Here's some more. Brake pedals and ski lifts. <laughs> think, think. You sit, think, seriously. This is, I got really deep on this one. You sit on a chair that goes up in the air in the mountains with no seatbelt. No seat <laughs> 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 
and you're like, this is going to work just fine. And you look up and it's just on one little, okay, really? This is what you're going to get for 11 weeks, by the way. I just want to tell you, this is the depth. Chair legs and x-ray machines. I did not see any of you walk in this room and go, okay, I'm going I'm to test it first. You just sat, sat down. What if I put a trick chair? <laughs> I wouldn't do that. That's not, we're in church. Wouldn't do that. Don Leith might do that. I would not do that. Car keys, restaurant reviews, back floats. Remember when you're a kid and the teacher would say, just stick your belly out and float. It'll work. And you're like, okay. And it works, doesn't it? Alarm clocks, nails, umbrellas. We could do this all day, right? We don't have a trouble with trusting. We, we don't. We trust. We trust in these things. And you know what I believe? I believe that what I trust more than these things is me. And I got news for you. I am not trustworthy. If you're my friend, you're like, whoa. <laughs> Here's why I'm not trustworthy. I'm going to give you an example. It's a confession, if you will. Um, I still can't believe I'm saying this out loud. I said it yesterday, yesterday evening, and I told them I'm not saying it in the morning because they're recording me. But I feel like the Holy Spirit's saying, oh, tell them how dumb you are. Okay. <laughs> so I do this for you. Um, I would say this. Trust is not hard. Um, oftentimes we lean on our own understanding. That's in the Bible. And in that situation, we often lean in on something that is not trustworthy. Prime example, Chris, as you can tell, I'm a contact lens wearer. Can you tell? No, because I don't have them in, because I broke them. Here's what happened, okay. I had a big birthday over the Christmas break, and, and that one birthday, I, I think I aged 10 years in one birthday. Is that thing? Can you do that? I feel real feel real old, guys. But here's what I did. I had great advice from many contact lens wearers in my personal circle who said, you should try contact lenses because I don't like the taking on and off of, con- of glasses and stuff and it makes my nose sweat and all those awesome things that you needed to not hear. And so I went to the eye doctor and I said, I want to do contact lenses. I'm really smart. I can do this. And so the doctor gave me the things and the little white and the green, you know, and I poured the stuff and I was really doing good. It only took me about 30 minutes to get each one of them in. Still got them in. Felt like that was good. So I went a couple days with these contact lenses and I could like see things. Did you know that that's what happens when you put them in? I know, right? You can see things. So I could see things. Well, the day after my birthday, I have to confess, I was, I woke up in the morning and I was all mad because I'm like, I think these dumb eyeball things ruined my eyes. I think I have a disease. And my husband looks at me and he's like, what is your problem? I'm like, my eyes are red. I have a headache. I can, everything's burning. It's killing me. And he's like, oh, okay, they look fine. I'm like, I don't even know. And it's Christmas break. And so there's no doctor. So I can't, you know, rush to the doctor and say, fix what's happening. And so I'm like, I'm just really tough and amazing. So I'll just endure this terrible pain and eye redness and we'll move on. Okay. So I made it through that day. I made it through another day. I made it through three days of this incredible pain because I had convinced myself at this point that I had some sort of rare eye disease and I was never going to survive it. And I was going to be blind. And it was all because these dumb contact lenses. Guess what? Well, okay. So here's what happened. Day three, I'm getting a little, I'm getting just, just a tiny bit grumpy. Not real grumpy because, you know, I'm just pleasant. But I was at home, so I was really terrible. You are laughing. <laughs> my mother-in-law's down front going, yeah, right. Okay. So my precious darling husband comes up to me day three, and he goes, hey. And, you know, I can't see him. So I'm like, what? And he goes, hey, did you, are you sure you took him out? And I'm like, <laughs> Yes. I'm like, who do I look? I'm dumb. What? I'm not dumb. I'm a professional contact lens wearer. Hello. He goes, okay, I'm just saying. He kind of walked out like this. I'm like, whatever. And so I decided to go. <laughs> you know what's going to happen. Three days. I go over to the little white and green thing. I'm like, I'm just going to look. And I open them up. I'm like, my eye disease. I can't even see if they're in there. They're not in there. <laughs> I'm like, good. They're not in there. That's weird. And then I did the thing that all the contact lens people are saying right now that I should have done the day one. And I went, I pushed on my eyeball because I'm a professional. And it goes, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I can see. My eye disease was healed and I could see and everything was wonderful. I took that thing out, threw it in there, took that one out. And I walked out with my head hung low and my husband goes, they were in your eyes the whole time, weren't they? (laughs) Welcome to Bible study. Um, I am not trustworthy. I trusted myself. I told him no fewer than 100 times over those three days, hello, am I an idiot? I, can, I know what I'm doing. I took them out. Only dummies don't take them out. Well, I'm a dummy. 
And you know, when I, when I, I, I did tell that story to Susan when it happened because I felt like I had to confess and, and I was just reading, hearing that and I was like, that is so embarrassing, but isn't that the way life is? Isn't that the way life goes? Like we decide that we know best, don't we? Yeah, I see some of you nodding your heads and the rest of you are just nodding your heads inside your head. We think we know best. And I just want to tell you something about our God is, is he's trustworthy and, and you are not. He's trustworthy and you are not. And you know what else is cool about God is he is trustworthy when your circumstances are not. I don't know your story. I don't know what you're going through right now. I don't know what you're struggling with, but I, I do know that we all walk in with a heavy load. Amen. No matter how dressed up you look and how cute you look and how smiley you are and how much caffeine you have, you have heavy things that you're walking through and you can't trust them because they change, don't they? Like one minute things are okay, the next minute the whole world's falling apart. Not trustworthy, but he is trustworthy. And I'll tell you this too, God is always trustworthy and the world is not. Amen? The world is not. And, and I don't know if you've called it this before, but I'm going to say it right now. There are things that you are listening to in your life. There are words, there are whispers, there are voices that are telling you lies. And God is always trustworthy. And so I would say to you, go back, take it back to him and ask him, is this your voice or is this the world? Because the world is not trustworthy. He is always trustworthy. Um, Lisa Turker said one time, trusting in God seems a bit risky. So often we place our trust in a solution that we make up ourselves. And then the whole bottom falls out, amen. And so when you take the step to start this whole thing, I wanna ask you, I wanna ask you this, I wanna ask you who you're trusting. Who are you putting trust in? Are you, are you crazy like me? And you're like, I know what I'm doing. I do not have contact lenses and I know what I'm doing. And then you see it all fall apart in front of you and you're like, yeah, I'm not trustworthy. Well, here's what I will say to you. Um, Psalm 31, 14 says it this way, but I trust in you, O Lord. I say you are my God, no matter what your circumstances are, no matter what decisions you make, no matter what the world is whispering in your ear, he is trustworthy. This semester, you're gonna encounter God this way. Are you ready? He is righteous, he is just, he is gracious, he is merciful, he's forgiving, he's trustworthy, he's compassionate, he is everlasting, he is loving, he is timeless, he is the king over all, he's the creator, he's a promise keeper, he's mighty, he's faithful, he's a sustainer, he's an enemy crusher, he's your rock, he's your savior. He's a dwelling place, he's a mountain maker, he's a refuge, he's a shield, a light, a rescuer. He is upright, he is a forgiver, he is a healer, and he is a redeemer. And that is just the first week of homework. I'm so glad you're here because this is the God that loves you and he wants you to trust him. Welcome to Psalms. I'm gonna pray and then uh, we're gonna dismiss y'all to your groups, okay? So pray with me. Father, um, we come to you today and, and um, we're, we're excited. Like there's an excitement in this room and I feel it, but God, I pray that, um, that we remember there are gonna be times in our faith and times in our study and in times in our, just our life that are dips, that dip down so low that we can't see above the surface of the water. Um, so God, in those moments, I pray that each woman in this room or listening online or watching will remember that you are always trustworthy, always. Even when we're underwater, even when we're floating up above. Airplanes and light switches. Lord, we wanna trust you blindly. We wanna walk into your truth with, with our heads held high where other people look at us and go, how can she trust in a God she can't see? And our lives will scream back at them, how can I not? So Father, we thank you for the book of Psalms. We thank you for what's to come over the next 11 weeks. You are going to do cool stuff and we're excited to buckle up and be along for the ride. Thank you for your son who came to this earth to live and die for us. And I thank you for this place, and we thank you for what's to come. In Jesus' name, amen.